Say amen tonight. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you for being here tonight in the house of the Lord. Got a great spirit in the house, and I'm excited about what the Lord's going to teach us. I want you to flip those bulletins over, and we're going to get busy with our seat work tonight. And you'll notate that we have four action-packed principles. We're actually got one little typo. All right, you might find some more, but uh, we got one little typo, and that is we're in part 15 of the power of one, not part 13. But uh, we've got some exciting things that we want to talk about tonight in the goods of the Word of God. I hope you have a Bible. This is Global Vision Bible Church. And so we think that uh, the Word of God ought to come out of the Word of God. Amen. And so I want you to follow along. I want you to write some stuff down. And we're going to have a glorious, glorious time in the Word of the Lord tonight. And then, Lord willing, uh, next week, maybe next week, we'll finish The Power of One. And uh, so only have one more week, and then we'll jump into the new series from verse 17 down through verse number 32, and it's going to be an action-packed series. You're not going to want to miss it. We're calling it Out with the Old, In with the New. Amen. I'm glad God can transform lives, and the power of the gospel certainly does that. And we're going to have a great time tonight and in the morning as well. Let's pray together, and we're going to jump right into Ephesians chapter 4. And in just a moment, we're going to be in verse number 14. We're going to take our time, plow through it tonight. So let's pray and seek the favor of God. Lord, we love you. And what a great honor we have to say that because you first loved us. Lord, I thank you so much for the great spirit in the house tonight, for the good singing. And Jesus, we believe. <laughs> we thank you that you can do the impossible in our life. And we thank you that you're doing the impossible in our church and in our midst. And we're watching you do some amazing things. And we say to God be the glory, great things he hath done. We say with the psalmist, this is the Lord's doing and it is marvelous in our eyes. We give you all the honor and all the uplifting and magnification for every single thing we see you doing in our midst. You are worthy and Lord, you'll share your glory with no one. So I'm praying right now in this room and right now around the world as we stream to so many people, I pray that you would be honored and glorified. People would be set free, saved, helped. Lives would be radically, dramatically changed because of the power of the gospel and the authority and influence of the Word of God that we're going to look into for these next few moments. Lord, four very important principles tonight, and I pray that you would allow them to melt our hearts convict us tonight, comfort us, challenge us, but more than anything, change us. Make us less of what we are by nature and more conform to the image of Jesus Christ in whose name we ask these things tonight and all of God's people said, amen and amen. Ephesians chapter number four, of course, we've been talking about the idea of unity. What unity looks like in the body of Christ, what unity looks like in the local church, what unity looks like in your home, in your marriage, and really in every relational connection and aspect of your life. There's something about unity, as we've said, every single service that invites the presence and the power of God. And so in this context, he's been talking much about unity being brought about because we are utilizing the gifts that we have. And there are no insignificant people in this room. You have a gift, I have a gift. Some gifts are more public, some gifts are more bold, more demonstrative, but all of us have a gift. And we've looked for several weeks why we have that gift. It's for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. And when you are using your gift, you are not just benefiting your spiritual growth, you are benefiting the spiritual growth of every single person around you, which would tell us you can also hinder the spiritual growth of those around you by not utilizing the gift that God gave you. If that makes sense, say amen. amen. And so last week we looked at the idea that because we are to grow up in our faith, because we are to get into the Word of God, and because we are to get to a place where we are less of who we are by nature and more conformed to the image of Christ, he then tells us because of that fact we have to obey the next command. It's not a suggestion. It is a command that we grow from where we are to where God wants us to be and where God wants us to go. Now, I'm also well aware of the fact that growth is a process. Not everybody grows at the same rate. Not everybody grows in the same way, but all of us are commanded by God to grow. 
2 Peter 3.18, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So growth is a product of the grace of God. So the more grace you experience, the more growth you should experience. Does that make sense? So you should not be as close to God today as you were last week. You should be closer. You should be closer to God next week and the next year and the next year. And the problem is there are far too many believers that sit soaking sour in a good service like this. They hear the Word of God. They never apply and appropriate the Word of God. And they spiritually stay the same size for the rest of their spiritual life. And God says we are to grow. So notice if you would please verse number 14. It'll be the only verse tonight that we're going to get to. I want to read it. Then we're going to go back and unpackage it. He says that... Now, that is in regards to the stature of Christ, to our growth process, that we henceforth, that means from now and forevermore, from this moment, no more exclusions, no more excuses, and there are no exceptions to this rule if you are a believer, that we henceforth be no more children. That's pretty plain, isn't it? He says that you from this moment forward as a believer be no more children because here's what happens to spiritual children. Tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. What a mouthful of a passage. We are going to have a great time unpackaging this. Please flip those bulletins over and write down principle number one. I've said it already, but I want you to write it down. We are commanded to grow up and stop acting like babies. Did you get that, church? We are commanded to grow up and stop acting like babies. I am convinced that the American church in the 21st century is filled to overflowing with spiritually immature people that cause drama, chaos, and problems because they've never grown up in the good grace of Almighty God. You know, I think sometimes that a pastor ought to take everybody in the nursery and bring them in the auditorium and take all the adults and put them in the nursery because sometimes we act just like they do, right? You ever notice how territorial children are? Guess what? Adults are the same way so often. You know, if you take two kids in a nursery and you get one Tonka toy and you put it in the middle of the floor, you better look out. World War III is about to break out because somebody is getting their way and somebody is going to get that toy. And they will bite and they will curse and they will devour and they will spit and they will pick their nose and wipe it in their friend's hair. They do not care. They will do anything they possibly can to get their way. And we all know adults just like that. You may not be throwing a temper tantrum in the Walmart aisle. You may not be in Kroger stomping your feet. I won't, I won't, I won't. But we do the very same thing in our relationship to Almighty God. We don't get our way. We suck our thumb, have a Pauline pity party. We get mad, get full of discouragement and bitterness and depression. And then it's God's fault. And then it's everybody else's fault. And then we get mad at church. We get mad at work. We get mad at every way that we possibly can. And the remedy to that is grow up. It's what the Bible says. We are to grow up. Now, I jokingly said last week, and I probably should have went through with it, I should have preached tonight and passed out pacifiers. Now, that would have been an awesome, awesome object lesson, right? Maybe get a bunch of, a pack of pampers up here and make everybody pick one up and sign your name on it. And I'm telling you, so often, you know as well as I do, that there are people that are saved, and they've been saved for years, and these are grown adults, and they act like little bottle-sucking babies because they don't get their way. Wah, wah. Me, 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 my, 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 I, I, I. And arrogance and pride keeps you from growing in the good grace of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he said that we henceforth be no more children. That means there's a time you can be okay as a spiritual child, but you need to grow up. You need to grow up. You know, when I was at the children's home, they used to have this saying at dinner, babies get fed, everybody else feeds themselves. There's a time that you have to be fed the word of God. And I want to feed you the Word of God. But if the only time you eat from the table of God's Word is when I'm giving it to you, you are malnourished and you are starving absolutely to death. You have to learn to feed yourself. Babies have to grow up. It's a natural process. Listen, why is it that we expect a baby to grow up naturally, but we don't expect spiritual children to grow up spiritually? We should. 
We look at children, we're like, okay, why aren't you walking the way you're supposed to be walking? Why aren't you crawling the way you're supposed to be crawling? Why aren't you talking the way you're supposed to be talking? Why aren't you eating the right things? I mean, we guard everything about the nurturing process of a baby, and yet we see people saved, walk an aisle, sign a card, join a church, get baptized, and we drop them flat on the floor and there's no discipleship process, and we wonder why people don't grow up. It takes more than me grabbing this microphone, screaming at you for 45 minutes once a week or so for you to grow up in the good grace of God. You're going to have to learn to pray. You're going to have to learn to get some accountability. You're going to have to learn to fill your heart and your mind with Christian music, read some good Christian books, get in the Word of God, learn about fasting, get some friends, join a small group, come to church more than once every now and again. Hey, you are going to have to make an effort to grow. It doesn't happen by itself. It doesn't happen by accident, and it sure doesn't happen by osmosis. All right, well, I'm going to stick my Bible under my pillow and wake up spiritual. (laughs) I wish it worked that way. That would be amazing, right? I would love to be able to take my Bible, open it to whatever page I want my life to look like, stick it under my pillow, and wake up the next morning, bam, like I popped right out of the Bible. No, it doesn't work that way. If you don't read the Bible, it's because you didn't pick it up. If you don't pray, it's because you didn't pray. If you don't come to church, because you didn't get in your car. Okay, you don't have a magnet on the front of your vehicle that just shows up at church. Well, I do, but nonetheless, I want you to understand that you have to make a conscious effort to grow. That's why people don't grow. Because people don't want to grow. People don't make an effort to grow. And yet Paul says to these Ephesian believers that you henceforth be no more children. The word henceforth would tell us there's a time that it's okay But it's not okay after a while. If a 40-year-old man walked through the back door with a diaper on, you would freak out. Right? And I'd make a viral Facebook video over. But nonetheless, I want you to know, why is it that we wouldn't expect a 40-year-old man to walk in with a diaper on and we would freak out? Then why don't we expect people that have been saved for 10, 20, 30, 40 years to grow up and get out of diapers and quit playing in a sandbox? Why is it okay naturally for us to be bothered by that, but spiritually we're supposed to overlook it? No, you're supposed to grow. You should know more word today than you did last week. You should be closer to Christ today than you were this time last year. That we henceforth be no more children. Which, by the way, the reason Paul was making this analogy was to get them to understand if you stay in your childish ways, there can be no unity because kids aren't interested in unity. Kids are only interested in what they want for themselves. And so it has gone from the nursery analogy into where people say, now I'm telling you one thing, if I don't get what I want, I'm just going to take my toys and go somewhere else. And there'll always be some church that'll take you and your toys. There'll always be somebody that'll take you and your drama. But guess what? Once a church troublemaker, always a church troublemaker, and you'll hop like a frog on a lily pad. Feed me, feed me, feed me, feed me, feed me. From one place to the next, and you will never be happy. You know why? Because you take you everywhere you go. Somebody's like, man, I'm telling you one thing. I've been to 40 churches, and I don't like none of them because you're in all of them. I've been married 50, 11 times, and I'm telling you, my spouse is never right because you are always in that relational disconnection. Every boss I've ever had is a jerk. You think? You cannot take you out of the equation. You have to grow up. Quit fussing about your Tonka toys and grow that you henceforth be no more children. Children should have a desire to want to mature, and the church in America is spiritually immature. Now, because it's spiritually immature, we're going to have the fallout that happens next in the text. That's why people don't know the Bible, and people swallow gullible nonsense, and they believe every single person that has a bad toupee and a Bible under their arm that calls themselves a man of God with some Ph.D. I'm here to tell you, if you are spiritually immature, you will believe some of the most crazy theological Facebook nonsense in the world. Sometimes I watch people post, and I'm like, how can you even believe that? You've got a brain and a Bible, and you ignored both of them. Are you kidding me? That you henceforth be no more children, right? If we want our church to be everything our church needs to be, we got to grow up. If you want your marriage to be everything it needs to be, you need to grow up. If you want your job to be everything that it needs to be, you need to grow up. You cannot stay the same size spiritually that you henceforth be no more children. Children need to grow into adulthood. If that makes sense, say amen. Amen. 
It's a command in the Word of God that most people do not take seriously. Matter of fact, they take it lightly and tritely, and we sit around on our hands and never use our gift and wonder why there's chaos and drama and disunity in the church and in the lives of the people around us. It's because we're acting like babies. We have to grow up. All right? Now, let's get into a little bit less abrasive part of the message, but it was a fun part indeed. Verse 14. That we henceforth be no more children. Watch what they do. Toss to and fro. They can't make up their minds. You have children? They're volatile little boogers. Right? Yes, no. Yes, no. Yes, maybe. No, no. Yes. Up, down, off, on, in, out. All the time changing their mind. Why? Because they're children. It's what children do. And yet the Bible says to adults... James 1, 8, a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. Tossed back and forth like the waves of the sea. You ever met somebody that's indecisive about everything? I'm not talking about small decisions. I mean, they can't even make any decision. I mean, they're always indecisive. One day they're in, one day they're out. One day they're saved, one day they're lost. One day they're married, one day they're divorced. One day they're broke, one day they're rich. I mean, it's all the time. Uh, Well, do I go left? Do I go right? Do I go up? Do I go down? They can never make any decision. Their heart is filled with chaos. Their heart is filled with, with schizophrenia, if you will. And the Bible says if you are a believer that is not grounded in the Word of God and you are not growing in your faith, you are going to be tossed to and fro and have an indecision about you that's going to cause frustration in your life and in the life of everybody you come in contact with. The Bible even says that you will be like an individual that is a servant sent by the king that has their legs cut off. Meaning by that, you won't be able to live out your full potential because you keep chopping your legs off because you won't grow and you can't make up your mind which way you're going. And that's where the church is in America right now. People have no idea what they want. They have absolutely no idea what decisions to make, what direction to go. And that's the generation in which we live. Everybody wants decisions made for them. Everybody wants easy street. Everybody wants free stuff. Everybody wants an easy life. No work, no sweat, no calluses on their hands. Everybody wants it easy. Let me tell you something. If you're going to serve Jesus Christ, you better know you better get used to the hard stuff because even the disciples looked at Jesus and said, Wow, what you just said was a hard saying. And Jesus said, Will you also go away? And far too many people leave and they walk away from the faith or they walk away from church, or they walk away from their lives, if you will, as they know them, because they can't make up their mind because their heart is divided by chaos and drama. Now write this principle down. I'm going to prove that to you. Number two, confusion and double-mindedness is a heart problem. Confusion and double-mindedness is a heart problem. 1 Corinthians 14, 33, the Bible says that God is not the author of confusion. Now, I don't know a lot about the Bible, but I got enough hillbilly sense to figure out if God's not the author of it, somebody else is. Listen, if you live in constant confusion, if you live in constant chaos, and if your life is totally surrounded by drama, you need to grow in your faith. Now, he's talking to believers, by the way. He's not talking to lost people. He's not talking to those that have rejected the gospel, stuck their fist up in God's face, and walked away from the church, and hate the body of Christ, and don't love Jesus. He's talking to believers, and he said, you have to grow up. But because you have a refusal to grow up in your disobedience and in your rebellion, you have created drama, confusion, and chaos. And I have never talked to so many people and counseled so many believers that struggle with constant confusion. They have no level of peace in their life whatsoever. They're always frustrated about something. They're frustrated when they're not frustrated. They're confused if they don't have something to be confused about. They're bothered by not having drama in their life. Chaos is their drug of choice. They smoke it in and blow it out. Why? Because their heart is double-minded. They cannot make up their mind. And the Bible says that's a dangerous person. They're unstable in all of their ways. Now... Let me be plain when I say that if your life is constantly shrouded by drama and frustration, you have got to stop blaming everybody else. So much, and this is in my own life, so much of the maybe trials, the problems, 
the afflictions that we walk through, let's be honest, a lot of it is self-inflicted. We endure a lot of self-inflicted drama because we kind of like confusion. Double-mindedness is almost our go-to method, as it were. But I'm here to tell you, that is a heart problem. It's because we're not growing in our faith. It's because we don't have a passionate desire to stand before God and beg Him to fill us to overflowing with the anointing and the power of the Holy Spirit because you can't be filled with you and God at the same time. You've got to get empty so God can fill you up. And we have been conditioned and challenged and we've basically been brought to a place in the American church where it's okay to be filled with drama and confusion. Listen, you don't have to go to bed frustrated tonight. And thank God you don't have to wake up as empty as a burnout volcano. I've never seen such a lack of peace in the church as we're seeing these days. There's just no joy. I mean, there's no spiritual spitzerington. There's no, there's no pep in people's step. They're walking around with their lips hanging down like dirty shoelaces. As I say oftentimes, come to church, look like they've been sipping on a PVC pipe full of lemonade and pickle juice. Always down in the mouth about something. Always upset. Always mad. And it's almost as if something, if it's not wrong, they think it's wrong. They've got to create more drama. And yet he says, don't be a child tossed to and fro. Make up your mind. You have to learn to make up your mind. And so the reason children cannot have great ability to make up their mind and make good decisions is because they're kids. And so he says, quit being a spiritual kid. Quit being a spiritual baby. Pull your bib off, okay? Put on some big boy britches and grow up so that you're not tossed to and fro. Make some decisions that are going to change your life and the life of the people that you impact. Because, by the way, the lack of your decisions is going to affect you and other people as well. But then keep reading. That we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, now this is big, and carried about with every wind of doctrine. Now notice how this is a direct result of not growing in your faith, of being spiritually immature. Why is that? I'll tell you why. Kids will believe anything. Oh, they will. Children are gullible. That's why you have to be careful of the authoritarian position that you have. You can make kids believe anything at any moment. You can convince them. And here's what God says. You know why you believe stupid stuff about the Bible? Because you haven't grown up enough to read the Bible for yourself. No scripture is of any private interpretation. The Holy Ghost is not going to tell me it means one thing and tell you it means something else. And the reason we are tossed to and fro and carried by every wind of doctrine and believe such nonsensical foolishness and then blame it on God is because children will believe anything you tell them. Just make it sweet enough and believable enough and they're gullible enough to swallow the whole thing. And I'm telling you, people believe crazy stuff because they don't understand the Bible. That's why I'm convinced that this type of preaching that we do, not just because I do it, but this type of preaching that we do, same bat time, same bat channel, and when we get in the Word of God, word by word by word, verse by verse by verse, book by book by book, chapter by chapter, that's important to give you the overall context. Have you ever sat in a service, I'm not berating other people, but have you ever sat in a service and heard a guy preach, and he gets up, and he announced a text, he reads half of it, and then he's in Genesis, then he's in Exodus, then he's all the way in Psalms, then he jumps to the maps, then he's in the, you know, the concordance, then he's back in Revelation, and then all of a sudden, by the time he gets done, you are as frustrated as a bald-headed hippie because you have no idea what this guy just said in this 45-minute rendition of what's supposed to be a message, right? That dude is all over the place. And everybody's like, whoa, that's preaching. What did he say? (laughs) Man, that was a message. I have no idea how to apply it to my life, but it sure was good, okay? I'm here to tell you the Bible will mess up a lot of what we call good preaching. I used to sit in some of these big pastor's conferences when I was evangelist. I'd be like, amen, that's good preaching. Amen, that's good preaching. Then I'd go home and read the Bible and be like, that was lousy preaching. (laughs) That wasn't even in context. That wasn't even biblical. That wasn't even a good application, much less the interpretation. But people believe foolishness. They're tossed to and fro and carried. I love that, carried about by every wind of doctrine. Something new, they got to jump to it. It's almost like they just kind of lick their fingers, stick it in the wind. And whichever way the theological wind of social media is blowing, that's the direction they go. That is dangerous. Get in the Word of God. Now, can I say something that I mean with all of my heart? (laughs) Nobody, and I mean nobody, 
Nobody has ever got into false doctrine by reading the Bible. Nobody. Now, I'm not talking about little philosophical inconsistencies. You might believe this or denominationally. You know, I'm talking about the fundamentals of the faith. I have never met anybody that got off track theologically that read the Bible. But I met a boatload of them that get off track because they listen to what somebody says about the Bible. So I want you to write down this principle. This is very important. Don't be tossed to and fro, he says. Don't be cared about by every wind of doctrine. How is that wind of doctrine propagated? Well, he tells us right there, by the slight of men. So write down principle number three. Get your theology from the Bible and not from some slick-talking preacher. Now, I know I'm pretty slick and quick when I talk. But I'm going to tell you right now. When Greg Locke deviates... From the text of the Word of God, Greg Locke needs to be called to correction and repentance of it. I'm not the sum total of theological gospel Bible truth. I'm a fallible man. I have feet of clay, put my socks on one foot at a time just like the rest of you, make mistakes, disobey, and sin against God like the rest of you. I am not the final authority, but this book we call the Bible is the final authority, ladies and gentlemen. And we got to quit getting all our theology from Facebook and from radio and from Lifeway and from TV preachers. And we got to get it from the Word of God. This book will not lead you astray. It will not lead you astray. There are times I say things that are going to be taken out of context. There are times that I say things I'll have to come back and say, you know what? I've studied it. And upon further analysis, maybe what I said wasn't correct. You've heard me before get up and say, you know what? Last week I said something that maybe was out of context. Maybe that story, maybe that illustration didn't quite fit. You know why? Because we are fallible men like anybody else. We don't worship men. We worship God, ladies and gentlemen. And we cannot get our theology by what everybody else says because there's a lot of nonsense out there that's being blamed on God it has nothing to do with God whatsoever. I mean, people believe in some crazy stuff. I mean, outlandish, bogus stuff that you almost have to be smoking crack to even believe. I'm thinking to myself, how can a saved person even swallow that nonsense? I was in California a few years ago, and, and I was flipping through the channels, and this guy jumped on the TV. His name was Dan Stewart. And he jumped on the TV and he held his wallet up. I think I told you this. He held his wallet up to the, to the camera. And it didn't look anything like mine. I mean, it was like, looked like a head of cabbage in this dude's hand. I mean, you never seen so many greenbacks popping out of a dude's leather wallet. He said, ladies and gentlemen. And by the way, be careful of them cats that change their voice when they grab a microphone. Man, that makes me nervous, right? Just talk like you talk everywhere, right? And so he changed his voice. He shook that big head of cabbage out of that leather wallet up in that camera. He said, ladies and gentlemen. If you will send me 1995. Now, time out. Let me tell you what you ladies know. <laughs> you ladies know that's just a nickel shy of 20 bucks, right? But it sounds so much less abrasive, doesn't it? <laughs> 1990, it just sounds better than 20 bucks. And so he's like, if you'll send me 1995, I'll send you a wallet that is so anointed by the Holy Ghost, you can't spend the money out of it. Now, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I wouldn't have believed that before I got saved. I sure ain't going to start believing it now that I am. But you've got to put your thinking caps on, church, okay? This guy said, send me 1995, and I will send you a wallet that is so blessed by the Holy Ghost that you can't spend the money out of it. If that dude's got a wallet he can't spend the money out of, why is he asking me for 1995 on TV? Somebody say amen, right? Why do people believe that nonsense? Because they're tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. They want to run after everything new. You ever heard a preacher get up and say, Well, I've got something going to teach you that's new. Just get up and walk out. Right. Ain't nothing new under the sun. If it's new, it ain't true. If it's true, it ain't new. It's been in this book for a long time. Yeah. Now, I might discover some truths I've never understood before, but I didn't make them up. They're not new. They've always been in the book. And when these people start coming up with new revelation, well, God gave me some extra biblical revelation. Well, guess what, Skippy? If it's extra biblical, it ain't biblical. I'm not interested in anything you have to say if it doesn't line up with the truth of the Word of God. Listen, I have lived too long, and I'm getting too old. Don't say amen, honey. I'm getting too old <laughs> to want to live my life in dece being deceived by people that don't believe the Bible. And matter of fact, 2 Peter, 1st and 2 Peter tell me that there's a lot of people out there that are crooks on purpose. Yeah. Did you know, <laughs> did you know that a lot of these guys, get this, do you know why they're rich? It's not just because they're such good talkers. 
It's because believers are so stinking gullible. Well, if I say it, they'll believe it. And it works. And it works. And we have got to get our theology from the Bible, not some slick-talking preacher. And yet, we see all this stuff floating around on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook, and people just gobble it up. Well, it's got God's name on it. It says Jesus at the end of it, so it must be right. Listen, test the spirits to see whether they be of God. Now, if God tells me to test the spirits, that means everything's not from the Holy Spirit. There's an unholy spirit, an unholy force of spirits that want to destroy churches. Now, let me tell you something. There is nothing, and I mean nothing, that will destroy a local church faster than bad theology. Huh? I know drama and disheart. I, I know that can happen. I, I know media frenzies. I know some disobedience and sin. Can, I get all that. There is nothing that will derail a church faster than getting away from the fundamentals of the Word of God and start propagating nonsense that God never put in His, wo- in his book and then getting people to believe it. But we call that guy a cult leader, not a pastor. Every word that comes forth from my mouth must be tested by the context of the Word of God because you better know this. When we are in contradiction to the Word of God, it is Greg Locke that is wrong and not the Word of God. It is Greg Locke that must be rebuked, not the Word of God. It is Greg Locke that must change his position, not the position of the Word of God. You know what James says? James says that the Word of God is a mirror. And if a man looks into a natural glass, he sees what is wrong. So here's what the deal is. When you see something wrong with yourself in the mirror, you can do a couple of things. You can change it and be better. Or you can just walk away from what you see, having seen it, and not be better at all. But there is a third option. You can change the mirror to make it show you what you want to see. And that's what the church in America has done. We don't want to be exposed for who we really are, so we've changed the mirror. We've dumbed down the gospel. We've minimized the truth of separation from the world. We've minimized minimized the truth of the authority and the influence of Scripture. And so what we do is we look in the Bible and we see what's wrong with us and we don't like it. So we don't change what's wrong with us. We change culturally the Bible. That's why the church in America today is accepting of things that 20 years ago would have been so unacceptable biblically, it makes our head spin to even wonder how so-called men of God can stand up and propagate such nonsense. Now, we're going to be loving and we're going to be kind and we're not going to be jerks for Jesus, but I promise you one thing. We will not in this church, as long as I'm the pastor and hold this microphone, ever, ever compromise the truth and the context of the Word of God so we can get a crowd. We will not do that. I'm not going to lay down the truth of the gospel so we can get more people in this building. Because at the end of the day, I'm telling you, the people are going to be coming to this building because we stand on the Word of God and because we propagate the truth and because we don't cut corners and because we call it what it is. People are hungry for a voice in the wilderness in a generation that is silent when it comes to the truth of the Word of God. Don't get your theology from some weasel-talking, slick willy preacher on TV. Get it from the Bible. Get it from the Bible. Boy, we can preach on that for a long time. As you can tell, we got to roll. That we henceforth be no more children. Tossed to and fro and cared about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men. By the way, we talk about slight. You ever heard of a card game? There's that, that slight of hand. That's what it means. They're crafty. They know what they're doing. They know what they're They will deceive you in a heartbeat. But it's not just those in the context of teaching people the Bible. Watch this. Whereby they lie in wait. They're dormant for a while. Looks like everything's going to be okay for a while. They got you right where they want you. They lie in wait to, out loud church, last word. That is their entire purpose. To deceive you. Now, we've all been deceived at different times in our life. You've been lied to? Raise your hand. Mm Mm-hmm. And if you didn't raise your hand, you just lied to me. So I'm going to raise mine right now, right? We've all been deceived. We've all been lied to. 
And yet the Bible says there are some people that have a proclivity to lie in wait to make you think there's something that they're not. Yeah. And you know what's interesting? Light always prevails over the darkness. And Jesus said, what you keep quiet in the closet, one day will be shouted from the rooftops. You can try to keep it all zip-lipped all you want to, but be sure, be sure, be sure your sin will find you out, Numbers 32, 23 says. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, but if we cover them, the Bible says, Proverbs 28, 13, we will not prosper. You know why some people are not prosperous? Because they cover and they cover and they cover. When the Bible says you better confess, you better confess, you better confess. But there are some people, they live their whole life with one purpose. To make you think there's something they're not. Right here it is in the text. Whereby they lie and wait. They're like a, they're like a tiger. They're like a lion in the jungle. Boy, they're, they're crept down behind some rock and they're just waiting for the opportunity of a vulnerable prey to walk by. Pow! pounce on you by the way that's devilish you know how i know that because first peter 5 8 says be sober be, be vigilant because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour he'll pounce on you any moment and use people to do it whereby they lie and wait to deceive write this principle down sad reality but it's a reality nonetheless people will deceive you but the truth will make you free you ever heard people say, and I don't want to split hairs, but we've got to be careful of context. You ever heard people say, well, you know, Jesus said the truth will set you free. No, Jesus said the truth will make you free. There's a difference in being set free and made free. You can be set free from jail, but if you still got an ankle bracelet and you're on probation for 10 years, you ain't been made free. you just been set free. <laughs> But when you get born again, when you understand the truth, you're not just set free. You are made free. God takes the ankle bracelet off. Amen. No more probation. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Now, at the end of the day, there's a lot of people in your life that if you allow them to, they will take up a residency that God never intended for them to take up in your life. You don't have the capacity to handle all the nonsense that they're going to push into you. And so they cause that double-mindedness. They bring about that drama and that confusion and that level of frustration. And here's what the Bible says. If you will get in the Word of God, you will be so much easier on yourself because you will be able to discernibly recognize when that stuff starts coming down your way. And I'm telling you, when God... <laughs> when God reveals truth to you... Now I'm... I'm I'm going to talk to you for a minute. When God reveals truth to you, woe be unto you and shame on you if you sit on that truth and do nothing with it when you know you ought to act on it. Hmm? Y'all get quiet on me. I'm going to preach 15 more minutes, praise God, and I'm hungry. Listen, I've been there. Sometimes you know what you're supposed to do. The truth has been revealed to you. Bam, right in your face, right? I mean, it is just there. And you sit on it. You think it's going to get better. You kind of change it here and change it there and justify it and make excuses for it. And God says, listen, there's going to be no real freedom until you quit being deceived by what you know to be deception. You better get you some truth and you better act on it. And whenever you do not act on the truth God gives you, you're going to live in further deception. And guess what? Everybody's going to suffer. Amen. Everybody is going to suffer. So <clears throat> sometimes that's a little more close to the quick than you can imagine. Sometimes I preach these sermons. If I did God, don't answer it. Sometimes I preach these sermons, and, and they're a little bit too close to the vest. You know what I mean? Say Amen. You know, sometimes you have to live out. Well, I say sometimes, every time. i got to live out all this stuff that I'm preaching to you. I'm like, how did you know? He's like, I'm God, knucklehead. That's how I know. That's what I like about expository preaching. You can't make this stuff up. There's no way weeks and months ago I could have said, well, I know what Sunday I'm going to be and what Saturday I'm going to be in this verse, on this word, and I'm going to be walking through the same thing. God said, no, you just keep being faithful. You keep showing up. You preach, you preach, you preach, you preach, and then every week I'm going to make sure you've got to live out what the text says. 
And I'm telling you, the most miserable you will ever be in your life was the Holy Spirit says, do this, do this, do this. And you're like, nah, I think I'll sleep on it. Nah, I think I'll wait. You better look out. You wait. It's going to get worse. 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 And what could have been handled as a firecracker is now going to be a keg of dynamite if you're not careful. You got to deal with the truth that God gives you. Why? Because sometimes people will just deceive you. And it's all in how you handle it when that truth is revealed to you. And so here he's very plain. He's like, look, you want your discernment level to increase? You better get in the Bible. Why are so many people led astray? Why do so many people act like babies? Why are we tossed to and fro? Why can't we get along? Why is there no unity? Why is there so much disharmony, so much frustration, so much bitterness, so much craziness in the church? I'll tell you why. Because we're children that need to grow up. We must grow up. Let me just tell you this, and we're going, we're going to quit and be done just for a minute till tomorrow. <laughs> when I lived at the children's home, I lived there for a little over four years, eventually worked there, was on the board for years and all that. Mike Glanzer was the director of the home, like the dad I never had in, the, in my life during that time. He was the only real disciplinarian and deep spiritual maturing influence. And I'll never forget, one night he, he came into my room, and I was probably, I don't know, maybe 19 years old. I'd been at the children's home for a few years, and and God had really been working in my life, but I, I went through a dry spell. You ever gone through a dry spell? We just went through a real tough dry spell as a, as a young believer of just a few years. And I was preaching and stuff on the side as much as I could, getting ready to go off to seminary and all that. And I remember one night, he was in my room, and I was just staring at the floor. I wouldn't even look him in the face. And he, would just, he said, look, I'm going to stay in this room all night long until you look me in the face and carry on a conversation with me fluidly. You look me in my face, and I'd look at the floor. You look me in my face, I'd look at the floor. And I'll never forget, he, just, he offered some simple words of convictional encouragement. That's the only way I can explain it. Convictional encouragement. It was encouraging, but it was convicting. It was so simple. So simple. And I'll never forget, I kept looking at the floor. I kept looking at the floor, up, look at the floor, up, look at the floor. It was just exhausting. He kept talking about all this, and I wouldn't get any of it. I couldn't tell you two things he said that night, and it was for hours. I'll never forget, Danny, he walked over to me. He got on his knees right in front of my bed. And he reached over and he took his fingers under my chin. He pushed my head up to look right in his eyes. He said, Gregory Dwayne Locke, you need to grow up, bucko. You need to grow up. And he walked out. And that's the only thing I remember out of a three-hour conversation. And I grew up. Let me tell you something. Let me lift your chin up for a minute. Look me in my two pastoral God-given eyeballs. We need to grow up, people. We need to grow up that you henceforth be no more children. Because until we grow, there can be no unity in the house. But when we grow and there is unity in the house, to God be the glory, great things he hath done. If you think our greatest days are behind us, you are in the wrong place. Our greatest days are still ahead of us at Global Vision Bible Church. And I believe the reason they are is because this is a Bible church. And everything we do is going to be based on the context of the Bible. And all of God's people said, Father, thank you tonight for the Word of God. Thank you for these principles. Thank you for the good stirring spirit in this room. And I pray around the world as people have watched by the thousands. Lord, we thank you for the privilege we have just to come in this room and hear the Bible. But we thank you for a greater privilege that we have to go out and live the Bible. Don't just let us believe everything. May we try the spirits. May we test the spirits. May we test man's teaching against the word of God because it is the final litmus test. It is the final authority of all that we say and all that we do. And when we disagree with the Bible, it is we that are wrong and need correction, not the Bible. A hundred times out of a hundred. So we thank you. And we pray, God, that you'd open our hearts and open our eyes to be discerning spiritually. That we would act immediately upon the truth and the promptings of the Holy Spirit and not sit on it, not wait, not disobey, because that only causes more drama and more unraveled confusion in our life. So, Lord, open our eyes. Open thou mine eyes that we may behold wondrous things out of thy law, says the psalmist. So, Lord, tonight may this book be the guiding force of our life. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy path. Lord, you affirmatively want to lead us and guide us as our great shepherd, but we have to submit to your voice. You said, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. 
Lord, tonight, may we not follow man. May we follow you. And I pray that each and every person that hears this message tonight and if Jesus tarry tomorrow would be made free because of the truth of this book we call the Bible. And as I was told so many years ago, so I say to myself and all of us tonight, you just need to grow up. Lord, help us to dig deep, mature, and grow up in our faith. In the mighty, wonderful name of Jesus, our blessed Savior, we ask these things. And all of God's people said, amen and amen. Thank you so much for listening tonight. We have our men to the back, and we have our men to the side. And just a